everyone, welcome. I'm Janet Jacobson. I am with Premal and Addison, the co-director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women this year. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to uh, our final event of the semester, the Roslyn Silver Science Lecture, which I will tell you about in a minute. Um, first, I would like to begin uh, with a land acknowledgement um, and a labor acknowledgement. So I would like to acknowledge that the land on which this campus was built is part of Lenape Honig, the traditional and unceded territory of the Lenape people of the Delaware Nation. The Lenape were displaced from their homelands to places as far as Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Ontario, Canada. We pay respect to indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, and uplift their continuing presence on their homelands. We also acknowledge the legacy of forced displacement, enslavement, and genocide of indigenous and African people from their homelands. We understand that our existence on this campus, using the resources of this institution, has been enabled by a history of both land and labor extraction. And on that note, oh, oh, okay. It's over here, that's why. <laughs> I'm on top of everything at the end of the semester, <laughs> everything. All right, in addition, I would like to offer um, a few thank yous as we start this evening. Um, and really, thank yous uh, you know, for a semester of, and a year of incredible work. Um, and if you're interested in seeing any of it, I do encourage you, much of what we've done over the course of the year is on the BCRW website at bcrw.barnard.edu, as will this lecture be in the future, so I encourage you to uh, go back to the website and uh, visit some of uh, the work that people have done over the year. So first of all, I wanna thank by starting, by start by thanking again Premila. Um, this is her first year as co-director and we are deeply, deeply, deeply grateful that she is doing it. Yay. Yes, clapping for Premila is appropriate. Um, I would also like to thank the entire uh, BCRW staff Miriam Neptune, Avi Cummings, Hope Dector, uh, Sophie Kreitzberg, who has worked on uh, this uh, event uh, in particular, um, and Pamela Phillips. Um, and they are just the most wonderful group of people and I feel very, very lucky to be working with all of them. Um, I'd also like to thank our ASL interpreters for this evening, um, Andrea Alefi and Michael Milley from All Hands in Motion. They've worked with us many, many times and we're forever grateful. Uh, three of our BCRW research assistants are here with us this evening. Yes, uh, we're very happy about it. Uh, we, again, they're just great to work with. Oni Woods, Kristen Santarin, and Ash Lewis are here. Um, AV Sound in the back is Sofia Rodriguez. Our colleagues at IMATS who make it possible for these events to appear on the BCRW website, uh, Claudia Gone, Mika Lugoliv, Klut, and Rachel James. Uh, events management, Kyle Krause. Um, Books are available through Word Up Bookstore, which is our um, uh, partner bookstore. It's a community bookstore in uh, northern Manhattan, and we are very happy to um, uh, get books from independent bookstores. And finally, I want to thank all of the facilities workers who um, make not only the setup and cleanup from this event possible, but really who make it possible to be on this campus every day. Um, and so thank you to them. All right, as I said, this is the Roslyn Silver Science Lecture, which uh, was endowed in order to bring the best in feminist science studies, science thinking, the best thinking about science to Barnard College. Roslyn Silver herself was a, a widely interdisciplinary person. Um, she uh, graduated in the class of 1927 and actually studied French while here, while also developing a lifelong interest in science. Um, and s similarly, the Roslyn Silver Science Lecture is fundamentally interdisciplinary in the way that most of BCRW's work is, which is to say it is about both the practice of science and science studies. Um, previous uh, scholars who have given this lecture include our own Rebecca Jordan Young, who you will hear from in a minute, who will introduce uh, our speaker, who is both a scientist and a science study scholar. Uh, our colleague, Jan Levin, who in theoretical physics. Uh, uh, Carolyn Bertozzi uh, gave a lecture in uh, 2002 or four, I can't remember. Um, and just this past year in 2022, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. 
Um, and I have to say that Dina Mirror, our colleague, when she introduced Carolyn Bertozzi said, and someday she shall win the Nobel Prize. And I thought, well, that's a little hyperbolic. Uh, but, but you know, it was a day of good feeling, so I'm, I went with it. And it turns out that, no, it was empirically accurate. Um, uh, more recently, volcano expert Tina Neal, um, uh, the environmental humanities uh, scholar, Anna Lohenhop Singh, um, whose lecture like, has been viewed online over 25,000 times. And then last year, again, this was thanks to the help of um, uh, Rebecca Jordan Young, uh, Helena Hansen, the author of White Out, How Racial Capitalism Changed the Color of Opioids in America was our silver science lecture. So we are here this evening adding to this illustrious list. And uh, in order to introduce our speaker and talk about some of our co-sponsors this evening, including the um, Critical Consortium for Critical Interdisciplinary Studies program in feminist intersectional science and technology studies, known as FISTS, so that's all you gotta remember out of this evening, FISTS, um, is the illustrious Rebecca Jordan Young. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Wow, I get to be illustrious tonight. That's super, super exciting. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so I am absolutely thrilled that tonight's silver science lecture is also um, the keynote lecture for our first ever FISTS conference, and that you heard it, Feminist Intersectional Science and Technology Studies, which brings together STS with intersectional feminism. So a few things about what this means, um, since this is our first event to formally launch the initiative. Um, so STS, or Science and Technology Studies, involves critical interrogation of the natural, social, medical, data sciences, where critical interrogation means that the grounds of knowledge production um, and scientific authority are scrutinized, including the underlying philosophical assumptions, epistemological frames, methodologies, institutional structures, funding, dissemination, etc., all the whole gamut. With FISTS, we approach that, STS, through an intersectional feminist commitment to foreground the implications of science and technology in terms of gender, sex, race, ethnicity, class, nation, religion, sexuality, disability, and age. And we approach these domains of power and, and identity as co-produced, entangled, and simultaneously experienced, rather than distinct. Importantly, FISTS isn't confined to examining scientific issues or practices that seem on the surface to be about sex, gender, or sexuality, but more broadly draws on the robust body of work by feminist and critical race scholars and also decolonial scholars that offer innovative epistemologies, theories, and methods to understand science and technology in our world and the way that they shape um, virtually every major issue that affects us today as well as our, in our bodies. So this powerful combination of STS and intersectional feminism is nowhere more apparent than in the work of Professor M. Murphy, who's our distinguished guest tonight and who I'll say a little bit more about um, before they present the Rosalind Silver Science Lecture. Um, first, I also have a few important acknowledgements and just a little in particular to acknowledge how fists got off the ground. Um, I want to echo the thanks to everyone who put on this talk tonight, <clears throat> and in addition to that, say that the FISTS initiative has been in the works for nearly two decades, actually. It's taken a long time for it to pull together, and it's finally achieved enough support and infrastructure to become a thing instead of just an idea. As of last year, students across the college can minor in FISTS, and students within uh, the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Department, or WGSS, um, as well as Africana Studies and American Studies can declare a concentration in FISTS. FISTS builds on initiatives old and new here, um, including this Silver Science Lecture, which has been a really important anchor for bringing critical S feminist STS here, but uh, also to things like a faculty reading group in feminist science and technology studies run by WGSS, which our colleague Hillary Callahan in biology was a part of, or the longstanding partnership between our department and Professor Laura Kay in physics and astronomy, who actually even chaired WGSS for some time and really worked to bring critical STS into 
our curriculum, uh, Professor Afsana Najmabadi, who was at one point the chair of WGSS here and really encouraged bringing that. Um, I could go on Kelly Moore when she was here in sociology, et cetera. So um, in uh, the more, more recent years, um, uh, FISTS has been supported, for example, by the Working Group on Recovery that is uh, funded through the Center for the Study of Social Difference at Columbia and co-run by Professor Bernstein, Elizabeth Bernstein and I, Professor Elizabeth Bernstein, who also co-directs the FISTS initiative. Um, so it's, it's in deeply embedded in lots of things that we've done here for many, many time. I've mentioned many of the people who were a part of it. I want to also now uh, just mention um, that the Consortium for Critical Interdisciplinary Studies where FISTS, the minor in concentration, are actually housed. As all of our colleagues in CCIS have been crucial to supporting this, to prioritizing it, to making sure that in Africana studies and American studies, we're also going to be rolling out courses that are a part of this. Um, and finally, I want to just acknowledge all of the faculty in WGSS who've really put a lot of thought into what this initiative would entail and have supported it from the beginning. So Professor Janet Jacobson, Nefertiti Tadiar, Manage Meradian, and our newest FISTS comrade, Marissa Solomon, um, who have all, and Marissa who helped to organize and is part of our exciting panel tomorrow on waste, race, and colonial detritus. <clears throat> Our FISTS conference is co-sponsored by um, BCRW, uh, CCIS, and WGSS, all of whom I've already named, and also at Columbia, the Center for the Study of Social Difference, the Presidential uh, Scholars in Society and Neuroscience, the Medical Humanities Program of the uh, Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, and the Society of Fellows Heyman Center. <clears throat> wow, with all of that, finally, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Murphy, our speaker tonight for this combined event. Murphy is one of the foremost figures in technoscience studies working in the world today. Professor of History at the University of Toronto, Murphy is a historian of the recent past whose research concerns decolonial approaches to environmental justice, reproductive justice, indigenous science and technology studies, infrastructure and data studies, race and science, and finance and economic practices. That list should give you a sense of why Murphy is known as radically and brilliantly interdisciplinary. Murphy's current research focuses on the relationships between pollution, colonialism, and technoscience on the Lower Great Lakes. Murphy is a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Science and Technology Studies. Some of you might know what, not know what that is, but it's a very fancy thing in Canada that is very important, and it comes with you know, lots of wonderful resources and an opportunity to connect many people, which Murphy does. Um, and uh, wait, uh, in Science and Technology Studies and Environmental Data Justice, I left that part out, as well as co-director of the Technoscience Research Unit, which hosts a lab and is home for social, social justice and decolonial approaches to STS at University of Car Toronto and a leader in, in those fields globally. She's Matisse from Winnipeg, from a mixed Matisse, is it Matisse or Matisse? I didn't know if you, thank you, Matisse, I would have thought so. Métis from um, a mixed Métis and French Canadian family, and that shows up deeply in the work that is done um, and that we're going to hear about tonight. So, thank you, Murphy, for joining us tonight. I couldn't be more thrilled. Uh, thank you, Beck. Thank you, Sophie. I don't know Sophie for doing all the logistics. Elizabeth for organizing. Thanks to the um, ASL interpreters. Um, it's really lovely to be here with so many um, familiar faces and friends who I haven't seen in a long time. And what a great name, Fists. I mean, it can't be undone. <laughs> so wonderful. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, a complete accident of a name. Um, so uh, I, I want to start off a, a little bit by, um, so my, my title of my talk is With and Against Technoscience in the Aftermath. And um, uh, the work that I'm going to be talking about today is influenced by what's happening in uh, this lab at the Indigenous Environmental Data Justice Lab, and here you can see our um, main crew. Uh, it's a mix of uh, Indigenous academics and Indigenous community researchers 
And uh, in particular, we uh, are obsessed with um, studying uh, this place, which is Ontario's Chemical Valley. And this is about three hours from Toronto, where we live, and is the place where some 40% of Canada's petrochemicals are refined. There are some 57 facilities here in Chemical Valley. And in Chemical Valley is actually on the land of, uh, it's Anishinaabe land, and it surrounds Amjanong First Nation. So you can see maybe a little bit on the, on the Google map, that little bit of green is where Amjanong's First Nations Reserve is, and it's surrounded by some 57 facilities above, on every side of the fence line, above, through the smoke um, plumes, below, through the pipelines and the waste caverns. And um, this has been going on for about 150 years because this is the site of the world's first commercial oil field. And, um, and so the folks at Amjanong are some of the world's greatest experts in understanding the impact of fossil fuel refining, fossil fuel pollution, and uh, what's broken about uh, the regulation of pollution. And our lab takes this approach, uh, indigenous feminist science studies approach. Um, so unlike uh, in Canada, what's really common is you have academics studying indigenous people, but our lab's about getting a group of indigenous people together to study science and the university and the colonial state. And that's this particular tradition in science studies. So what I'm gonna be talking about is this. What counts about pollution? How is the techno-scientific understanding of chemical pollution built out of a racist entitlement to killing? And what might an anti-colonial feminist queer counting of chemical pollution be? And I ask this question in honor of um, a friend who's missing here tonight, um, Diane Nelson. Today is the one year anniversary of Diane's death. Diane's a, a friend and a, and a longtime colleague and comrade who worked on uh, feminist science studies, but importantly on post-war Guatemala and at-war United States, and wrote a very important book, um, Who Counts? The Mathematics of Death and Life After Genocide, which has taught me a lot about the question of who counts and what counts, and I'll be drawing on um, this work in the talk. So to give you a little sense of what it's like uh, at Chemical Valley. This is a, a video um, just taken from a cell phone on February 23rd, 2017 of a flare. Flares, accidents, spills, events happen on an almost daily basis in Chemical Valley. This is the information we got about that flare. Um, the flare was at the Imperial Oil Refinery and what we are told is that there was a grass fire. I don't know if that looked like a grass fire to you. Um, that no emissions were detected and no one was hurt. So this is just a little snapshot of the political situation of colonial violence that's happening in Chemical Valley. And uh, BZ and Vanessa, who are on, uh, Gray, who are on the picture in our lab are, are two community, longtime land defenders and community members of Amjanong, um, formed an organization called Amjanong Solidarity Against Chemical Valley. And they have been tracking these notifications since um, 2013. And here you get a sense of just some of the ones that happened right around this flare. But this is the level of information we get about each accident, each spill, and so on. And so what we are doing a lot of the time is trying to confront the erasure of this environmental violence, but also place it in the long legacy of colonialism. We're obsessed with this particular refinery, which is the Imperial Oil Refinery. And it's, to our understanding, the oldest um, running refinery in the world. It began in 1870. So that means the history of this refinery is also the history of the establishment of Canada as a settler colonial state. And so these two things go together in our work in figuring out what counts about pollution. So the, the kind of epistemic question I want to dwell on today is about the kind of techno-science aftermaths of trying to count pollution um, in the ongoing violence of colonialism. 
What if the objects and scales academic disciplines offer us, from chemicals to gender, are caught up in the ongoing violence we seek to dismantle? So I'm kind of obsessed with this question. Um, and I'm obsessed with it in relationship to thinking about chemicals and what's a chemical. So uh, I'm a historian, so I often find myself going back to the 17th century. I just can't help myself. And I want to ask, how is the formation of chemistry and experimental science caught up in colonial violence? And when I say colonial violence, I'm thinking about this kind of like church, company, state trifecta um, that's formed in this period. This is actually the logo of the um, Company of Massachusetts that helped to uh, found Massachusetts in the United States, a charter company from Europe. And you can see in their logo, it represents an indigenous person who's saying, um, come over here and help us. So uh, one of the founders of chemistry is Robert Boyle. He wrote The Skeptical Chemist. And he is also one of the founders of experimental science in the Royal Society. The Royal Society and his work on the air pump is really famous. It's the case study used to talk about the historical founding of experimental science, about the formation of a kind of objectivity built out of the idea, uh, uh, built out of the subject position of the male colonizing gentleman who can stand in as the neutral observer. It's part of a kind of project of universal knowledge making where the knowledge that's made in the experiment even can then be applied to the entire world forever. And uh, it's part of a project of making experiments that reduce relations, simplify phenomena in order to make them replic replicable and kind of seem universal. And it's also part of a, a project of forming experimental science through what we could say is taking and killing as projects of knowing. The Royal Society was at the beginning of the belly of the British Empire. They went all around the world taking their objects, would bring them into um, the Royal Society, and they were very fond with this air pump of killing all sorts of birds and small animals um, by the scores. And so killing actually was foundational to the beginning of what's called modern chemistry. So the other thing about Robert Boyle that no one talks about was his other passion besides the Royal Society and chemistry was he was the uh, governor of a charter company, a royal charter company called the, Prop the, uh, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in New England. And this society um, was involved in trying to convert indigenous people in New England to Christianity. And as part of doing that, um, as settler colonialism arrived in New England, they rounded people up into what was called praying towns. And praying towns were spaces that were supposed to be operated according to a set of kind of Protestant Christian rules for indigenous people to be converted in. And if you, as kind of settler colonialism thickened there, if you left the praying town, the law was you could be killed on sight. So they were, became a kind of, the beginning of a carceral relationship, right, and the kind of precursor to the reservation, and were, we would say, a tool of indigenous genocide because what happened by 1685 is King Philip's War happened, and they did just kill everyone who wasn't in a praying town. So that was Robert Boyle, and we don't talk about that side of Robert Boyle, that that was his other great passion, that this, this kind of uh, project of killing is foundational to experimental science and chemistry. Or what we could say, drawing on Eileen Morton Robinson, that white possessive is foundational. It's a structure of entitlement to violence and possession rooted in race and patriarchy. And this is inside of chemistry. And this way of this entitlement, we can say, is rooted in the doctrine of discovery. And I'm sure folks here know that doctrine of discovery, but it, you know, is this entitlement to violent possession, the entitlement to wasting, um, to uh, taking, to enslaving, if you are not properly a Christ Christian sold. And the doctrine of discovery, which, I don't know if people follow this, but the Pope just like took it back like a month ago, which was like, I never thought would happen in my lifetime, and, and I, I still don't know how to take this in. But the, the doctrine of discovery is under all this in my thinking. And the doctrine of discovery, you know, was, is under this 
company, charter, royal charter company, that then turned into the nation state, which is now what we look to to regulate environmental violence. So in the case of Canada, um, the charter company was the Hudson's Bay Company. They got to own all of what was called Rupert's Land with a single document. Henceforth, this land is yours to do as you will with. Um, from the beginning, it was a practice of, uh, we could say, transnational racial capitalism, a process of taking timber, killing beavers, taking indigenous land. Um, and inside of it is this, this important claim, entitlement, that some shall be killable and wasteable for the sake of the accumulation of others. And so it's my contention that this deep logic is inside of contemporary chemistry. Um, we can look at uh, Max Liberon, uh, Mitchiff, another Métis scholar um, who I've collaborated a lot with, who has developed the argument that pollution is a form of colonialism. And we can think about this not just in terms of the way we, the way we think about environmental racism, that particularly communities have concentrated um, concentrations of, violent, of environmental violence on them. That is true. But it's also that the very allowance of pollution, of a distribution of killability that's built into our petrochemical relations is grounded in this doctrine of discovery thinking, is grounded in the entitlement to wasting um, others. And we can see this uh, in the contemporary. I kind of got obsessed about this in June 2022. Um, so last summer, when uh, in the Supreme Court here passed these three things all at the same time. One, Oklahoma versus Castro Huerta, which was that the um, uh, state police could overturn indigenous jurisdiction and, um, and, the, and the police jurisdiction then overtook uh, the, the rights of, of indigenous tribes and nations to govern and police their own territories, so that's an important thing. Secondly, West Virginia versus Environmental Protection Agency, in this case, um, preventing the federal government from regulating climate change emissions. And the last, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, which we understand is like the overturning of Roe v. Wade and the protection of like we could say bodily autonomy. So all these things happen simultaneously in June, and I see them as connected. They are this unrolling of a long legacy of entitlement to a certain kind of taking and possession. And I think that this is inside chemicals. And that's a really hard thing to think because environmental justice relies on chemicals all the time to make its claims. Whether it's about what's happening with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, whether it's about trying to show a particular company is doing harm and you find the pollutant, whether you're trying to understand a cancer cluster, we turn to chemicals all the time. So what do we do when we have this object that's really messed up, and I'm gonna go a little bit more into how messed up it is, but we also are using it for our justice work. So this is kind of what we use today for, our, our, for our talking about chemicals, and it's uh, you know, a kind of structural diagram of a, of a molecule. This is naphthalene. Naphthalene is one of like, the worst of the chemicals produced in petrochemical refining. I think of this as like chemicals in white space um, because it is about taking away all the relations that we might under, need to understand chemicality through. Where are all the other chemicals? There's no one molecule by itself. That's not a thing, right? Um, we get that, that molecule, that chemical in white space, or you might say it's like the chemical of white supremacy or so on. Um, we get that because there's a history of molecular governance that, had, that grabbed onto the chemical in the late 19th century. Why? Not because it had any environmental interest, but because taking a chemical one at a time in a stru unique structural diagram was something that could be turned into a commodity. It's a commodity form foundationally that then we have inherited into our environmental regulation and justice work. So chemicals in the contemporary, I think, are this manifestation of colonial capitalism. They're abstract and universal. 
We treat them as molecules with just these physical qualities that are commodifiable. We look at them one at a time without their full sum of relations. We see them as small things that are imperceptible, which is nutty because like everything is made out of substance. Um, we keep the effects to bodies and lands as well as where chemicals come from separate from our understanding and built into them is this entitlement to possess and kill. And so what we have when it comes to environmental regulation is a lot of this. It's a lot of kind of data, a lot of counting without a lot of regulation of actually the effects of chemicals. And that's one of the, the um, effects of this history. So we, what we have largely in Canada and the United States and most places of the world is something we might call a permission to pollute state, which is a kind of ongoing form of colonialism. And I really don't see this abating in any way. So what might an anti-colonial feminist theory of chemicality look like? If we don't want to do that, what do we want to do? Like, how do we deal with this? This is kind of what I spend a lot of time working on. This is a with and against technoscience question. So the three things I want to talk about with you today is what would it mean to rethink chemicality starting with land? Um, to do counting as an infrastructural and ethical relation, so an aftermath kind of counting, thinking with Diane Nelson, and to embrace a desire-based orientation to thinking about what is chemicality. So first, starting with land relations. Um, this is what we do in our lab. Um, we try to start everything with land relations and indigenous jurisdiction. And here, we think about land relations as not just the specificity of place, but because we're working on Anishinaabe territory, it's a particular understanding of land and a particular land relation. And one way to think about this is not place-based, but place-thought. And that's drawing on the work of Anishinaabe Haudenosaunee scholar Vanessa Watts. Place-thought is the non-distinctive space where place and thought were never separated because they never could or can be separated. Place thought is based on the premise that land is alive and thinking and that humans and non-humans derive agency through the extensions of these thoughts. So this is a really different relation to land. It's not land as resource, it's not land as soil, it's not land as substance. Land in this, land is like an inadequate word to name this, but land is where law derives. Land is where beings derive from. I'll, I'll get more into this. So if we're going to do place thought for us in our lab, place thought's not universal, right? So again, so the first move, we're getting away from universal knowledge. Not just place-based knowledge, but ask, what is your place thought? So for us, we have to think about indigenous jurisdiction. We're on uh, a particular land. And we start with the um, Dish with One Spoon Wampum Covenant. Do have people here know about this Wampum Covenant? Probably some of you do. But um, you, have ver you have versions that come around to New York too, like the Common Pot. Um, so this is a covenant from the 17th century, a kind of pre-colonial covenant. This is what like a treaty looks like before paper, the paper contract. Um, between Anishinaabe Haudenosaunee people to live together peaceably on the Great Lakes and kind of kind of treat it like through the metaphor of a dish that one has to share and eat from, not just together, let's say, in this room, but for the generations yet to come. So if that's what we have to do, if we have to live with this one dish, what is that going to look like? The wampum has to be, in order to have this treaty and relation, you have to return to it over and over and figure out what it does. So unlike a contract, right, where it's like we signed and now we stole your land, this is something you have to polish, return to, keep alive, keep the wampum belt alive. The, the leather coming out the sides also indicate that this is supposed to go on into the, the future of many generations. So we begin here. Um, but what I want to highlight for you in this talk is a really different way of understanding land-body relations that come out of Anishinaabe and Métis place thought. So I'm going to be drawing on the art of Métis artist uh, Christy Belcour. And maybe people know her art because this was really circulated in the um, uh, Standing Rock 
no dapple, like many different indigenous land defense struggles use Christy Belcour's art and this piece, Water is Life. Um, but what I want you to notice about it is how the, the person in this image is coming out of the water. The water is moving through her. Inside of her is a non-human being contained inside of her. Here's another image from Christy Belcour. Turtle woman is making an offering of wampum to the plants of the river. So if you look at this image again, the turtle is speaking fish. Inside the turtle is a beaver, right? So the question of how do we understand being as coming from land and water? How do we understand what's inside what? Who and what is inside of us? And how might we think about ethical relations, not just between humans that might exist between humans and non-humans, but also between non-humans? So here's a kind of final one from her, water has no flag, and you kind of get this repetition and sense of like what is inside what. This is not an ecological relation of objects in a functional relation. Right? And so when we, when we think about this, I want you to kind of unsettle your sense of reproduction. Reproduction doesn't go. Hum humans get together or with a scientist and make another human, <laughs> right? Or, you know, two beavers get together and somehow make a beaver, right? It's not that, it's that actually the land makes humans and beavers and fish in these complicated what is what, what is in what relations. And the land is where, and the what is where future generations come from, right? It's not inside of the species being. Okay, so if we take this way of thinking, we can then look to this kind of work from Native Youth Sexual Health uh, network. Violence on the land is violence on our bodies. Well, you know, the, what's happening with the lands and the waters and so on and our condition of being is not just wonderful waters and beautiful turtles. It's also pipelines, um, refineries, uh, disruptive infrastructures, colonial states, and so on. And so understanding that these disruptions to land are also what's making us Violence from pipelines is violence on our bodies. And so I just want you to kind of think about this rescaling. So this way of thinking, right, meets up with multinationals. The multinationals who make the pipeline and own it, the multinationals that run the refinery, so the Imperial Refinery is actually owned by ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil is one of the biggest um, multinationals in the world and a top five contributor to climate chaos. So once we start thinking about these companies are also part of this process of understanding land-body relations and their disruptions, then you know, we started to think about, okay, well, who owns these dang companies? Well, it turns out they're owned by particular banks or owned by particular hedge funds. Who is here when we're breathing in these chem this chemicality, right? We can look that there's 33 banks that are the, the main ones that fund most of the fossil fuel sector. There's some 100 companies that are the biggest emitters for um, greenhouse gases. And, and then if we look at each of these companies, we immediately find they're mostly owned by global finance capital. So hedge funds and so on. So this is who owns Imperial Oil. It's owned by Exxon in majority. Exxon is run by, like for example, Vanguard and so on. So really, it's also, now we're in this disrupted state of being not just in chemicality and the molecules, but our being is being made through these relations of, the, of finance capital as extensions of this long history of um, white possession. So chemicals, I wanna say, are bigger than we thought. They're not molecules, they're these extensive relations with all their responsibilities and ethics. So the first move is placing the chemicals in these relationships of responsibility. To understand chemicality is a structure, not an event. People who read settler colonial studies will hear that echo, but or we could say is a relation, not an event. And so for me, a, a, a painting like this by Kent Bunkman, Victory for the Water Protectors, is a much more accurate 
portrayal of chemicality or naphthalene than that structural diagram, right? The criminalization of land defense, the uh, permission to pollute co of colonial violence. Okay, the second little move that I wanna talk about is reworking chemical data. And so, as I mentioned, a lot of what we are dealing with when it comes to pollution is in the form of information, inform and either the n denial of information, information that's a theater of lies, or uh, erasure. And so, in our lab, we are a lot of the time working with what we call bad faith data data that's replete with bad relations. And what we're trying to do is move from using data as that which is evidence of harm and showing how the data is the source of harm and violence itself. So people might know about these kind of indigenous data sovereignty principles of fair and care. And we are trying to be thinking about what's a place-based or place-thought chemoinformatics that we can do. So in our work, we collect the data that's around about Chemical Valley and try to put it in its relations, try to call it into its responsibility for the crappy way it's put together, but also we attempt to reassemble it in order to connect that bad data to perpetrators of ongoing violence. Um, we sometimes say connecting data to responsibility. So we have an app, um, that tries to do this, that tries to connect the polluter to the pollution, to the health harms. Um, and we built this with folks from Om Janong and um, for Om Janong. But we also we work to try to reimagine what pollution data might look like. This is a, a project, a community project we did on the one hand, it's like how the Canadian states understands pollution data. And on the other side, we asked the question, what pollution data could be if it started with accountability to land, understood in this Anishinaabe way? So the part I wanna share with you is like, this is kind of where we come with. We start with this, this is the answer, right? The voice of the land is in our language. We have to begin there. We have to begin with tradition and ceremony values are rooted in the land. The health of the land determines our responsibilities to future generations. We are here because of our ancestors. Honoring our ancestors means taking care of the land, past, present, and future. Living well with the land is a human right and responsibility. So it's a real reframing of even like how you would begin to imagine what data could be if you start here. So that's the second way that we're thinking about with and against chemicals. And here's the third. Um, what would it mean to make a desire-based versus damage-based approach to chemi understanding chemical pollution and chemicals? So we mostly look at chemicals because they're really they're hurting people. They've created injury. They've been done disruptions, right? But can we make a version of chemicals and our kind of techno-scientific relationships to them and our anti-colonial relationships to them that come from our desire to live together otherwise and to be together otherwise. So another way we kind of think of this is um, kind of a more than pessimism, less than optimism. So yes, we are deeply pessimistic about all the relations I just described. And at the, so the same time, even if it's maybe not gonna work, we're gonna insist on a kind of desire-based, joyful practice. And so this is an image that we often use by Mo Thunder, the land behind the fence is still sacred. This question, what does it mean to meet the land where it's at, after it's been disrupted or in the midst of its ongoing disruption? And when we say, what does it mean to meet the land where it's at? It's also, what does it mean to meet each other where we're at in our disrupted, messed up state and try to build a joyful, otherwise another kind of techno science in that? So in doing that, I've been thinking about this term alter life uh, to name um, this condition. So in the area around Chemical Valley, um, whether it's birds, fish, mollusks, plants, humans, mammals, 
every form of living being in this area is metabolically disrupted by this 150 years of fossil fuel pollution. Every one of those kinds of organisms that I mentioned is um, developmentally disrupted, reproductively disrupted. Their sexual development is altered. And that's the same for humans as well. So if we want to meet the lands where they are, right, how do we think about this condition of being in a state of disruption? And now this state of disruption is intense around Chemical Valley, but it's here in this room too, right? We are at the point where BPA is an airborne constant event that everyone here is breathing daily such that we all have chronic BPA in our bodies. BPA is a well-known endocrine disruption chemical. You cannot get it out of you by like not drinking a pla out of plastic containers. It is airborne. We all have PCBs in us. We all have DDT or DDE, it's metabolite from the legacy of global spraying and so on. So we are all unevenly already developmentally, metabolically alter life. So alter life names are kind of being altered by violence that can still become alter wise in the ongoing aftermath, which is another way of saying, yes, we are perturbed. Yes, we are altered and disrupted but we're still becoming in relationship to each other. There's still space for this uneven becoming. So EDCs, um, which is endocrine disrupting chemicals, is another thing I'm kind of obsessed with. And um, how do we think of the ubiquity and uneven presence of EDCs in all of us? EDCs are famous for disturbing fertility, right, for changing genitalia, um, and so on. They also affect every part of the body, me me metabolism, insulin, thyroid, cardiovascular system. Like, th th it's not, you know, they're often called like things that are connected to sex, but they are much more systemic than that, even as they are things that, al that can alter sexual expression of the body. So the thing I've been thinking about EDCs is, um, we're surrounded constantly by non-consensual EDCs, or um, endocrine, dis endocrine, we could say not disrupting, endocrine participating chemicals. We're also born and live with inside of us internal exposures to hormones that we also didn't choose. Your insulin might work a particular way, you might have a particular amount of testosterone or a particular amount of estrogen that you like or don't like, that's disruptive for you or not, that you did not consent to. You're stuck internally with particular cortisol levels in relationship to ongoing stress that you might experience from, let's say, chronic exposure to racism and hate. So, th there's, so to understand our hormonal in our hormonal being as profoundly shaped inside and out by non-consensual relations. Only a tiny sliver of space in terms of like particular drugs that we can consensually get into having some fun with our hormones, right? But in general, we're in this non-consensual situation. And it's not only that it's non-consensual in relationship to our surround, but it's also non-consensual in relationship to the way endocrine disrupting chemicals work, which is they have epigenetic effects. So that we're also non-consensually affected by the exposures of our ancestors that have metabolic implications for us. So what do we do about this? We're in this you know, non-consensual metabolic chemicality of becoming, right? That's replete with these hostilities. Right, we can, from the hostilities of heteronormativity to the hostilities of white supremacy. So here I'm trying to think through alter life, a kind of trans ecologies way of thinking about chemicality and chemical becoming. Um, a desire-based becoming that's not singular but with others in hostile and perturbing conditions. We are caught up in, each, in structures in which we hurt each other and get hurt in order to live. Right? Being in this space, using this laptop, this electricity, we are in relationships of hurting each other in order to live, to know, to work, and so on. So 
how can we grasp that and then orient to the challenge of making collective conditions towards an otherwise of thriving in this chemicality where it's at, right? The lands where it's at in this ongoing aftermath. I see that as the kind of desire-based question. So I have a couple, I'm just gonna end on a couple um, things that make me feel happy about this. One is, okay, so it's not this, it sounds kind of sad, but it, I'm, I'm gonna not, I'm gonna show you how it's not. So chickadees and sparrows and lots of common birds that live in highly polluted environments, their song changes when they develop in polluted circumstances. So chickadees that develop in relationship to PCBs have a different song. But it's also the case that sometimes, and this is a, a study on starlings um, that I have at the bottom, 2008, sometimes these songs that, well, they change, they change and become like super varied or really loud. And it turns out that starlings that are exposed to pollutants, when they sing in this way, they just have tons more sex. So that's my one. <laughs> okay, here's another one. The round goby. The round goby is like a, a invasive fish um, that's in the lower Great Lakes. It's about this big, but you can't tell that from this image because it's so scary. They treat the, the round goby like a criminal or like a, an illegal, sometimes it's a criminal, an illegal migrant. They want them dead, not alive. Um, but the goby, I also just can't help but love. The goby lives in garbage in the Great Lake, in the most toxic spaces. And in the presence of these garbage toxic sites, it manifests a greater manifold of gender expression. And in its greater manifold of gender expression, it becomes pervasive in that space. And so I see the round goby, the starlings as, you know, examples of the ways that we might meet each other in a kind of thriving if we can pay attention. So to end, um, I want to end thinking back with Diane. When we're thinking with and against technoscience, we're not just studying technoscience. Diane Nelson was a really um, a scholar who was ethical and political in all she did. She had an incredible radical integrity as a person. Um, and she insisted on joyful play as part of addressing um, intensive violence. And uh, in her book that's called Reckoning um, the Ends of War in Guatemala, um, which is the second book in her genocide trilogy, um, reckoning is what you might call studying or researching, but it's so much greater than that. So here she says, working in Guatemala in the post-war period, I found many people questioning their assumptions, what they thought they knew. This leads many to questions who they were and are. They are pondering what to make of the individual and collective experiences of consciousness raising, of organizing, and of opting for or against projects like land reform and transforming a government rooted in ethnic and class exclusion that seemed to promise liberation from exploitation, immiseration, racism, and justice. For many, this was the end or goal of their activism, but they are also reckoning with the devastation caused by the military state's scorched earth counterinsurgency campaigns that killed and wounded hundreds of thousands and swept up millions of people as victims and as perpetrators. Depending on one's perspective, this violence ended either the threat of or the hopes for radical change. To measure possibilities for the future, people ask, what was it all about? What kind of person was I? Am I? What kinds of people surround me? Is resistance futile? What exactly do we resist? Of course, Guatemalans are not the only ones to ask such questions. So I feel as we are staring down unfolding massive environmental violence, as we are living already in its ongoing aftermath as alter life unevenly, and as we are staring down it for the next generation, 
Um, I think this question of really reckoning as a, as a kind of ethical practice that's part of our feminist science studies is something that Diane has taught us. So I'll leave with these questions. What needs to be stopped and not reproduced into our futures? How might we start with our varied place thought instead of the planetary for taking on environmental violence and techno science? What do our communities need to endure and keep healing? And how might we oriented, orient towards collective desire within the ongoing hard times? So thank you. <laughs> thank you to my powers. I know I spoke fast because I was like worried I was gonna had too much to say. I apologize for that. Hi, thank you. That was awesome. And my name is Hillary Callahan, and I teach ecology here. And right. um, just uh, this week, I we were discussing what ecologists do is substitute um, space for time and time for space when we do our studies. And you just apologized for talking fast. I did not perceive it as talking too fast or too slow. It was just right. And I'm wondering if you might. Um, this place thought idea, mm -hmm. um, is there a time thought counterpart to it and have you considered that? Because hmm. I feel like we all think we're on Greenwich Mean Time, right? And it's not a global time. Time is very mm -hmm. um, varied. Thank you. I mean, I love that. We could think time thought. For me, place thought comes from a particular indigenous feminist commitment for where I am and where I'm working and the kind of work I'm doing. And so place thought as a particular indigenous feminist or indigenous commitment isn't for everyone. Not everyone has a commitment to a, a place thought or a kind of um, obligation to begin with land in that exact way. So I don't think that necessarily everyone should take place thought, like take it. But to think about the question of um, uh, where you are and what are your responsibilities uh, as a non-universal beginning point. Um, so, that, so that's the first thing about place thought. And then secondly, I don't know, time thought sounds like really important. I think there's actually a lot of time thought in place thought because in the work that we're doing, you know, it's always like if we go back to, um, you know, this where it was a, a attempt to just um, boil down to the basics, right, of where you could start. This is all about time. You know, and it's an understanding of the yet to come, the yet to come and the ancestors as being like responsibilities. But I like that. Thank you so much. Um, very rich, too rich. I couldn't, <laughs> no, Sorry. not too rich. I just mean that I need elaboration on um, mm -hmm. One point, which is okay. uh, reworking chemical data, or reworking data altogether. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if an example of what you mean, and I don't know exactly how your mm -hmm. app works. I was mm -hmm. desperately trying to see. Um, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, but I wonder if, you know, this new big data collection that is using satellite data to identify um, uh, uh, carbon emitters, fossil fuel emitters, really in a granular way so mm -hmm. that you can really check like people's, uh, people's nations emitter, uh, uh, emissions mm -hmm. um, in order to try to then, you know, shut it down. Mm -hmm. um, is that an example, I mean, I know that there's much more to what mm -hmm. you were saying, much mm -hmm. richer than that, but is that reimagined data in your um, I would say there's, there would be two parts of it. One is how to use data to connect back to perpetrators, uh -huh. yeah. right? Because we tend to use data to connect to a, a, an environmental harm, right? But then people are stuck with, oh great, we have like a measurement that there's something in your blood, but no way to pull it back to a set of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So reorienting data towards the question of responsibilities and perpetrators. So that's one part of it. Yeah. But the second is to understand the bad relations that are already in the data. So in that instance, we could say, who owns the satellites? What's the history of the algorithm that makes the pixelated work? Well, it probably comes from some US military. Like, 
So there's all these bad relations in data collection. So in, when we get into the weeds of this kind of stuff, we will look at a monitor, like an air monitor. We'll take it apart and understand how it's made to not see. Because they're actually built to not, measure, to not catch the thing. Because they're industry-placed monitors. They pick the, the one that does a snapshot every like hour, as opposed to a continuous. They pick only a couple chemicals. They put it low. And that's just one example. Mm -hmm. um, they'll use words that don't make any sense, like hydrocarbons. There's a thousand kinds of hydrocarbons. That means tells you nothing, right? If you say hydrocarbons were emitted, that tells you nothing. So there's all sorts of maneuvers and bad faiths in the data collection. Mm -hmm. Most of the data that we have in Chemical Valley are not based on any physical measures, but are based on mathematical estimates. And the mathematical estimating system is built by industry associations. It turns out that the data for Chemical Valley is run by a industry association, and there's five companies who are on the board. If you look at who owns those companies, it's Saudi Aramco, it's United Arab Emirates, it's Exxon, Shell, and Suncor. So, th so there's so th and two sides. One is, how is the data not proof of the pollution? Because we know the pollution is happening. Or the harm. But how can we show the perpetrators? The perpetrators are the emitters, and the perpetrators are the permission to kill structures that the state allows, that allows those perpetrators to do that. So that's the two sides of how we think about data. Can I just, yeah. uh, it seems like it's all about tracing, you know, harms to the perpetrators, mm -hmm. actually. I mean, in trying to understand bad faith data. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, the difference is that conventionally, what a university research team would do would be to come in and try to measure health effects. For example, collect data on health effects. Um, sometimes they want to collect air monitoring data. You go to, uh, to Chemical Valley, go to Amjanong, surrounding community, you don't need any data. You could talk to anyone and they can tell you for generations the health effects and you can feel with your senses within minutes the pollution and you, you can see it, you can smell it, it's on your skin, it's in your lungs. And so the premise in, in certain situations that you would need the data to show the harms, those kinds of harms, and then the research comes in and shows these kind of harms and they put it in the bodies of the people most affected, that just becomes perverse. It's not, so the date we, so there's a way that data doesn't prove environmental violence, but I think we can backtrack it to show the creation of perpetrators and the perpetrators are people who are making bad data, that kind of thing. It's not to say that data has no uses, but I think that's in general what we're talking about. Thank you for that. I'm just going to follow up on that question. Yeah. Um, so interesting. So, and it's reminding me of a um, sociology colleague, Tony Hatch, you probably know as a paper called The Data Will Not Save Us, about COVID right. data, right? So I'm thinking about um, these links that you're making and um, tracking the perpetrators. And then my question, I guess, is a political question. Mm -hmm. Then what, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, will this data save us? Where do we go mm -hmm. from there? How, what are the imaginations? You know, so we've named the perpetrators, so we've tracked the finance capital. Mm -hmm. What's the ask then? What happens mm -hmm. next? Well, so it's kind of tricky for, for us because the, this is Amjanong territory. It's up to Amjanong to decide its own jurisdiction. So we, our lab follows what Amjanong wants, for example. Um, the things that can come out of this kind of research is that um, the theater of data is destabilized. Um, so the idea, the kind of PR idea or PR presentation that the state is actually regulating and is actually present in some kind of um, regulating fashion as opposed to being 
the vehicle of settler colonial violence, that is the narrative we want to build. And we want to understand that, you know, in Canada we have the truth and reconciliation um, process, which has really focused importantly on uh, residential schools and child theft. But there's another side to understanding the deep um, violence of Canadian colonialism, which is this land theft and um, fossil fuel killability, fossil fuel killing. Um, and so we want that to be a popular understanding of what Canadian, how Canadian colonialism operates. Um, it's, I think, important to target the few banks for divestment and the few companies because it actually makes something that's unmanageable seem like a little bit more like you could do something, right? You can go disrupt an AGM. You can, you have an actor to work with as opposed to the general way we think about climate change, which is like we're all doing it every time we're in the car, you know, we're all part of this. Well, there's only actually a real small number of real jerk actors who probably are donors to your university <laughs> and are probably in your pension fund, right? And so identifying that as part of it. The other is these companies are transnational companies. They don't care if their refineries here, they are the next place. So if you can make enough trouble and destabilize, for example, their claim to land, if you can bring suits against them, which Am Janong does, then they can be like, this is too much of a hassle to run this refinery since 1870 here. You know, we'll pack up and do it someplace else because we got lots of fines. Now that's kind of messed up, but it's also part of a local strategy of wanting to see the worst perpetrators close shop. Um, sometimes when I end this talk, I show two images. One is of a sister refinery from 1870 that blew up two summers ago. So if you don't maintain it, it will blow up. The other is an image of one of the big towers in Imperial Oil Refinery falling down, just like accidentally. Now, no one was hurt, but it wants to come down, right? So if you don't maintain it, it will fall down and explode. So that's, you know, the other side to it. So these are some of the tactics on, on tracing perpetrators. Also, people want to know in Am Janong, like if you have like many relatives who, let's say, died of blood cancers related to benzene exposure, you want to know which of these neighbors is such, you know, is such that they are happily killing you and your family. You want to know that. Hi, thank you so much. This was a remarkable talk and it's very exciting to have you here. Um, as a member of a different uh, interdisciplinary feminist science research group, I would love to hear about uh, you and your colleagues' collective practices of thinking together, how you all maybe find one another, maintain mm -hmm. your collective practice in spite of any disciplinary or vocational differences. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's really exciting to me that this FIST thing is happening and seems to like, you know, be official enough that it gets like money or like faculty or something. Um, which is great. Um, at University of Toronto, we've mostly kind of taken a hack the university approach. Um, so the Technoscience Research Unit has a status that um, we call everything at University of Toronto a research unit, but officially you need to be a center, an institute, a department, a program. But somehow we've managed to have them accept us as a research unit that can hold funding and staff, but not be governed by their processes. So that's trick one. Trick two is on trick. It's that it takes a lot of then time internally to decide how are you going to come together and govern yourself. So when we started our lab, the first six months was just all about what are our values, what are our protocols, how are we going to come together, what does it mean to author, and so on. And if people know like Max Liberon's Clear Lab, oh, um, that's a kind of another model. And so a lot, there's this its own research project, which is how can we do research another way. We don't always get it right, 
But a big part of it is that to be part of our Technoscience Research Unit, you do not need to be a student or a faculty at the University of Toronto. You can be from any place, any institution, and you can be a community person. You don't have to have an institutional status to get an expertise. Um, so that's an important ethic for us in terms of doing this kind of work and doing a kind of the, the kind of solidarity work. So we have people who are much more like land defenders or who come out of more grounded activist work. And then we have, you know, more like nerdy people like me who like are really into chemicals. And so, and then we have to figure out about how to be in solidarity with one another. And so the, uh, another side to that is sometimes it can take a lot of processing. Um, the great feminist, I don't know if you want to call it feminist and queer tradition of processing. Um, so that it take, can take a lot of time that uh, another kind of academic coming together doesn't allow. Um, and so you have to have a real commitment of care in your practice to one another to do it. So it is a kind of hard thing. It's probably a kind of fragile thing um, as well. Hi, that was really beautiful and um, I think very inspiring. And um, what I wanted to pick up on was this uh, connection between the, the question about data mm -hmm. and data being a commodity, just like the chemical removed. You know, it's, it's about information, right? But the question is really about the kind of, um, what you ended on is what kind of research, what kind of knowledge production, what kind of communication um, then, and you use a lot of art, you mm -hmm. use a lot of uh, language from indigenous elders, indigenous community members, yep. you know, what are the role of these other kinds of, um, you know, outside of the, you, you mentioned in the beginning, outside of the disciplines that train us onto objects and scales mm -hmm. that are part of the problem, yeah. and therefore, you know, restoring some kind of, or not restoring, but reaching for another kind of knowledge that the word interdisciplinary doesn't even really um, adequately cover. This is something that I also think about. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's just a broad question about your thoughts for yourself because I understand the collective stuff like, mm -hmm. you know, that could, it's very hard to say that you're all doing one thing, but for yourself, mm -hmm. what kinds of um, knowledge production, research, and communicative practice in writing and, you know, I mean, even this talk to me was very communicative in another sort of way, even though it's perfectly legible as an academic talk. It had many dimensions that definitely reached out outside of academic talks. What your thoughts are about this within the university and within, or those who straddle the university and elsewhere, um, just give us some yeah. of your thinking about this. Not this other, this is what I thought about, that your, your, your manipulation of the, not manipulation, but your use of data and, and information and chemicals is the exact opposite of what it is for the academic disciplines. So those are the object scales that we want to move away from. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful question. Um, the, a lot of what we do in the lab has no academic form to it. So, and it's very, um, so for example, we will have um, like community meetings where it's just a lot of listening and then there'll be a, a graphic note taker who, um, who will try to capture what was said and then we have another get together and you know at the get together there's like food or bingo or, you know, something like, um, pot, you know, it's a gathering. Um, and then we have a, a chemical, a, no, sorry, graphic kind of note taking that we bring back and get more kind of thoughts on. And then that, though, that kind of note that comes out of like the community analysis, we will then print up and, you know, disseminate, but that we don't publish that. That's on academic output, right? Ultimately, we are doing this work in a relationship to land defense, in an obligation to the land defenders we work with. Um, 
the academic side in a way is secondary. So like I, this kind of talks like an epiphenomena on another kind of reckoning work that, that we're doing. Um, it takes a lot of consultation, a lot of relationship building goes on. Um, it, that's very slow and um, frustrating sometimes. Um, uh, we have you know, members in the lab that are on like the youth council or the, in the environmental committee. They're longtime land defenders. They have relationships to the older land defenders who are also sharing what they've gathered in the pre-digital time. And then we try to represent, bring that back, get the analysis and so on. But then we also have to take what, what, pe what the ask is, right? If the ask is this to be analyzed or understood better, the ask might be, can we build something like a tool? Um, so those things can get credited, but that's not their purpose. And so I would say like over time, I feel like our lab has taken on an ethic that the work we do is not really for academia. It has to be for something in the world. And then we happen to be in the university where we can appropriate resources, including distribute money and library cards and certain kinds of access um, that then becomes the presence of the university. So something like that, I would say, is kind of what we've come to over time. Um, but then the weird thing is the university likes that. So, <laughs> you know, so we don't necessarily tell them like the actual content, but like because I think what you know what you could say is like community grounded research is actually pretty rare. Um, they like that, and. Um, and then also, I, in order to keep this all going, I do a, I write just tons and tons of grants. So a lot of what I do is grant writing and fundraising to keep everyone employed to do this kind of work. Um, but the other interesting side is that lately, chemists who used to think I was a total wingding, um, now there's like a subset of them who actually want to collaborate um, and think differently understanding that chemistry, their discipline, is totally caught up in this massive violence. And their discipline has totally inadequate ethical systems. And they don't even know what sustainability is. They don't even know how to begin to think about it. So the other weird thing in terms of how this is, is that chemists want to now work with our lab, et cetera. So, um, so in a way we're being pulled into, especially me, into, I would say one of the most conservative disciplines in all of the university. Uh, like imagining this collaboration between like indigenous feminisms and the chemistry department. <laughs> right, it's kind of unheard of. So I don't know, that's maybe a little bit of an answer. I don't know if it gets to it a bit. No, you just, you got to the part that I forgot to ask, which was, you know, that the altar life you, you held out at the end, yeah. but it wasn't, it, it wasn't by itself the thing because you also held up for the possibility of a transformation into an altar wise. Yes. So there was something Altar more. life is towards the altar wise for yeah. sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow on your answer to Neferti, but thank you so much, that was brilliant. Um, and thank you for the work that you're doing and also just, um, uh, how heartfelt your knowledge project is, um, which is something, again, in terms of the academy that, you know, um, we're sort of trained not to uh, allow ourselves to have that. Um, and so I guess I wanted to actually um, perhaps speak to the historian part yeah. uh, that, you know, shows up in your talk and then you then quickly go to the we and the mm -hmm. other things, but I, I thought that actually, the historian part has a lot to offer, um, and that there was, um, uh, in the structure of the way that you were trying to look at the development, even to like begin with Boyle, um, you know, and, and because of course that's also the beginning of possessive individualism, and and like asking the question like, where did separateness come from in that yes. way, like that, I mean, which is something Ashil Mbembe talks about, but you know, like pre-modern, thought did not think separation, that was 
not the way it happened. And um, so it made me think about another uh, moment in the history of chemistry, which is um, Lavoisier. Mm -hmm. um, and basically the introduction of the idea of the closed system mm -hmm. as being like the um, framework within which one could uh, uh, produce truth um, because it became quantifiable. Mm -hmm. And um, and I also, this is another thing I really appreciate about the movement of your talk. You started with counting and ended with reckoning, but reckoning is counting. Yes, it is. I mean, so that, that but the, the possibility of, of, you know, what closed systems um, are uh, reliant on, dependent on, is mm -hmm. are these modes of quantification and, mm -hmm. and um, the quantification kind of places itself as a way, of, a mode of thinking valuation. And I guess what I was thinking about in your talk is that, you know, ultimately, and, and maybe we're all, all hoping for this too, is that, you know, there's a certain kind of value schema that, you know, we, name, we can name as colonial settler, appropriative, mm -hmm. but, um, but that we don't necessarily talk about it as, it, like, um, or I don't know if this is our opening, but but what we're seeking is like the transvaluation of all values, you know, mm -hmm. like that, and that, you know, and you can. What I thought was amazing, you could start from anywhere, like chemistry, you know, which seems to be nothing to do with that, but obviously even the production of the possibility of that as a kind of disciplinary separation. So I guess I just wanted to ask the historian in you. Mm -hmm. um, like where you are in that and how you see the w ways that, uh, obviously there are other indigenous ways of thinking about temporality and relationships to the past, and, but history is, is this way um, and you do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you could just tell us a little bit more about um, your doing of that. Um, I appreciate that question. I am, you know, I can unhealthfully get obsessed with Robert Boyle um, since graduate school, I have like boxes of research about what a deadly dude he was, <laughs> and um, uh, and 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 that is not dis the history of science remains an incredibly conservative discipline at its core, and refuses to take on the force of white supremacy inside of its you know heroic storytelling. Um, so uh, I appreciate that you um, heard that. I think that um, we do in the lab historic practice because part of what we do is we try to document that Chemical Valley was made possible by um, colonialism and indigenous genocide. And we document that in excruciating detail in terms of land, in terms of land theft, treaty, the creation of the reserve system, the residential schools, the language laws, the clearing of the land to allow the property relation and to allow then the kind of rampant first pulling of the oil from the land and then all the refineries and, and so on. And so that's an important part of our work is this historical work to like retell fossil fuel production in the history of settler colonialism and to say that Canada is responsible for a violence there. Um, and then what you said about value, I kind of feel like the most important value maybe in this work is the value that's in the Mo Thunder piece of art, which is the land behind the fence is still sacred. So the value of being from, um, loving our perturbed and messed with beings and not giving up in each other under those conditions as the secret sauce and the theory of change actually for massive environmental violence. Um, that's the seed of less than optimism amidst the what Diane Nelson called uh, a paranoia you can not keep up with because it's so right. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, there's all these values and we can think about value in all this quantif quantifiable way, but then there's this other value, which is 
like that which is um, wa designated as wasted, remaindered, um, expendable, um, and killable is, um, you know, actually where many of us reside. And we need to have our own value system with each other in that. And I'll just say one thing is like, and I really appreciated at the very end that, that you ended with, the second, the penultimate point was uh, ended with healing. Because yes. I think that that, I mean, I just read a book about that, but anyway. But <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Okay. Can we just thank everybody for coming? I really appreciate seeing all these beautiful faces and, and thank not you. speaking into a Zoom screen. Thank you. And, and I want to acknowledge what both the incredible, you know, the incredible importance of the work that you're doing um, broadly and the, and the fact that it is so profoundly politically grounded and gives us really a way into the altar life and altar wear. Please, let's thank Murphy one more time. Thank you. Altar wise, altar everything. <laughs>